I am so excited to share this conversation with Andrew Stack today. My name is Steve Lambert. I am the co-founder of the Center for Artistic Activism. And at the center, we use people's creativity and culture to impact power. Now, Harry Potter is a huge part of our culture and tremendously popular, read by millions of people around the world. And um, this is Andrew's project goes, you know, back a couple decades, pre controversies with J.K. Rowling. Um, but uh, the book and the characters, a lot of people related to. And what Andrew figured out was how to mobilize them and create the Harry Potter Alliance. The Harry Potter Alliance took people's, uh, like how they related to Harry Potter as a character, Harry Potter's values. And as Andrew said, you know, how do we, what would Harry do? What would he do in the real world? And then they tried to do those things and they were very successful. In this conversation, we'll talk about some of those successes, like cargo planes full of, uh, of uh, disaster relief going to Haiti um, and changing corporate policy. But we also get into what to me is like fascinating is how do you get people to do this? How do you get so many of them? There were chapters all over the country hundreds of members, thousands. How do you get people who are into a movie to like become activists often for the first time? And those lessons are in this conversation too. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. We get into a lot of really good stuff around ethics and how you involve people and honoring them as complete human beings. I don't want to give it all away. You'll see. So I hope you enjoy this conversation and I'll see you on the other side. All right, Andrew, how do you define fan activism? I think you'll get different answers to that question. Um, and, and I might give a, a, a very unique answer. So I graduated from college in 2002 with a, uh, a real passion for uh, activism and movements, um, but also for, uh, for theater and storytelling. I wanted to find a way to merge those things. I was in a comedy troupe performing all over the U.S. at that time, and I ended up falling in love with Harry Potter, which was something I never anticipated. I, I didn't even, I, I thought the idea of Harry Potter sounded very stupid to me. Yeah. Um, and I, I, then when I read the book, the first book, in uh, on Halloween of 2002, uh, something just shot through me. It just felt like this, this my whole life had just changed. Huh. And, and I can get into why it's a, it's a much longer story to that, but I became addicted to, to these books and I became addicted to the, the childlike wonder that started coming over me as I was reading them. Um, mm. and yet as I read the books and fell in love with them, I began to grow frustrated. You had fan websites that were talking about Daniel Radcliffe and the actors in the Harry Potter fan community. You had, um, uh, you had podcasts, you had fan fiction, you had those types of things, conferences, and then you had Wizard Rock with fans like Harry and the Potters, a punk rock band that sang from Harry's perspective. And they had an enemy band called Draco and the Malfoys who sang from the perspective of, of Draco Malfoy. Um, and you had, you just had so many different interesting things that were happening, the beginnings of a Quidditch League. Um, but what was very strange and annoying to me was that if, so this is where I was frustrated, if Harry Potter were in our world, he would do more than simply celebrate how awesome it is to be Harry Potter. He would fight for justice. <laughs> yeah. He'd, he'd, he'd fight for justice in our world the way he fought for justice in his. And in the books, he starts a student activist group called Dumbledore's Army. And so I just began just thinking about the idea of what if what if there were a Dumbledore's Army for our world? And we called it the Harry Potter Alliance. Uh, the word alliance for me came from just this, this uh, feeling of World War II anti-fascist ideas, and the allied forces, that, that kind of idea. And um, I ended up meeting Harry and the Potters and then other big name fans and just sort of gently persuading them on this idea. And they were so receptive that I began writing action alerts where it would I would write about something happening in Harry Potter and then use that uh, as a way to talk about something happening in our world. So an example of that would be Voldemort returns and the Ministry of Magic is denying that he returned and the uh, the consolidated media in the wizarding world is denying that he returned. And it's up to Dumbledore's army to wake the world up to the fact that this has happened. 
Um, and um, uh, so then that's a, that's a great analogy for uh, or parallel for so many different forms of activism, whether it's fighting uh, media consolidation, fighting a human rights crisis, in this case, it was genocide in Darfur, working against the climate crisis, things where a sort of corporate owned media structure uh, is preventing people from seeing uh, the reality of what's taking place. So out of this, we began to uh, uh, organize leaders of the Harry Potter fan community such that we began having campaigns that were very media savvy. So we would, we would make those campaigns happen along the rituals going on in the Harry Potter world when a, the last book came, up, came out, when a new movie was coming out. We always connected it back to those rituals and then that got a lot of media attention, which then increased morale of the fan community. So it's this virtuous cycle, which then brings in more partner organizations, um, and then with time, we began seeing real concrete victories. Um, so for instance, uh, and, and you know, it was very strange in the beginning. I was 25 when I started this uh, with a couple of friends and um, uh, telling people that you, you know, you're working for the Harry Potter Alliance at that time was, was really weird. Yeah, um, yeah. Arguably it's weird, it's weird and awesome, but, but uh, it was hard to be taken seriously in the very beginning. But uh, the feeling of that was just so deep um, that this could work. And that the, the enthusiasm and innovation that I was seeing from fans was so extraordinary. We were working with people who are some of the most artistically interesting people, and they're all convening on the internet. And um, we began to, as we were building these concrete victories, giving opportunities to, to volunteer for us. And our, our scrappy volunteer team with me started the chapters program. By the time I left the Harry Potter Alliance, which is now called Fandom Forward, uh, in 2015, 2016, there were hundreds of active chapters. Uh, these are active chapters. That's not even counting the chapters that had formed and fizzled over time. Hundreds of active chapters in over 30 countries on six continents. Um, at that point, we had uh, we had shelved, we had donated enough books to shelve libraries all over the world, from uh, an orphanage in Rwanda uh, to a learning center in the Mississippi Delta, um, and uh, and different just different parts of the world. We uh, we won a six year campaign to convince Warner Brothers to make all Harry Potter chocolate ethically sourced. Mm -hmm. uh, we we uh, we did a lot of advocacy on um, everything from LGBTQ equality to, uh, to economic rights. And, and, I mean, it sort of goes on and on and on the, the list of accomplishments. Um, but in all of that, as we were being taken seriously, what I think. I mean, there was stuff on civilian protection, it, 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 uh, sending five cargo planes to Haiti full of life-saving medical supplies. Um, wow. And yet those planes, for instance, every one of those planes was more than just a plane. Every one of those planes was winning an argument that fantasy is not an escape from our world. It is an invitation to go deeper into it. And we dream at night, but it is our books, our TV shows, our movies, our musicals, our comics, our video games that is our culture dreaming. And when we're working with those cultural dreams, we're doing cultural dream work. And when we're working with the cultural dreams uh, that are most popular, we're doing cultural acupuncture. And I, I wanna talk about cultural acupuncture in a minute because that's sort of the mm -hmm. key term for me with fan activism. Um, in fact, do you mind if I just cut right into that? Or I, I Yeah, can, sure, can... go for it, yeah. So cultural acupuncture is about finding where the energy is in the culture and moving that energy authentically to create a healthier body for our world. And uh, the proverbial needles of cultural acupuncture are, are myth or big story. Like what is that big story? Ritual and community. Um, and I would put things like symbol into ritual. Uh, you know, myth is an underlying story that motivates the whole piece. Um, but ritual is where a myth is enacted, as Joseph Campbell uh, wisely put it. And if you want to change the myth of a society, the big story of a society, you got to change the rituals. Um, but you also need a community that is vibrant and that is practicing um, and enacting those rituals and that, that myth. So working with a fandom or being in a fandom, being a fan activist is about activating those three things. And one of those things is good. But all three of those things together, history of social movements shows us that those three things, I call it MRC, myth, ritual, community, that is the good, and that's the goal of a social movement. That's when you know that you're going to create a seismic change. I'd love to discuss that with you further, including the dark underbelly of what is fan activism. Because, you know, one of the things that we, you know, at the time we were celebrating fan activism so much, but it's also something to remember that, uh, that a great example of harnessing popular culture, uh, through fan activism 
was uh, was Birth of a Nation and Woodrow Wilson, and uh, and that repopularized the KKK. And I would argue that fans of Birth of a Nation who felt inspired to become part of the KKK thanks to that movie were totally fan activists. Um, but yeah, that kind yeah. of that kind of loosens and widens our definition of fan activism to understand that fandom is really connecting to this myth ritual community structure. And so when you see Donald Trump as an example, he has a very strong MRC. You know, Hitler had a very strong MRC. And if the good guys do not have a strong MRC, they're going to lose. They're going to yeah. lose to the bad guys. Because um, uh, fascism tends to work with a very strong MRC. Uh, MRC is a very amoral concept. Um, right. you want to use, it's magic in Harry Potter. You want to use it uh, um, in, in, in any direction. Um, when you were talking about that, like I, I was reminded of it reminded me of how I saw like people that did graffiti in like the late nineties was just like, mm -hmm. this is so amazing. It's like all over the place, but like, why are you just writing your name? Like you could, <laughs> you know, like you have basically billboards across the whole city. Like why just a name? And um, you know, there's, there's reasons for that. But, um, and I don't know if you know, Justin Krebs, but he started this group called drinking liberally. Right. And it's like, people are going to bars or hanging out in bars anyway. You might as well like, turn it into something that could become action. But um, it's got to require sort of other education, right? How do you how do you do that? How do you I mean, if it's literally maybe tools like here's how you make a video online and post it. Here's how you organize a group, you know, or um, the education on the issue to say this is worthwhile and something you can actually win. Like, how did you guys do that part? There is a version of this question where I can talk about what I did. And there's a version of this question around tactic where it's like, what are we all doing? How do we look around and see ourselves as alchemists and see that the lead can be transformed to gold? Justin Krebs was drinking liberally is a prime example of that. Where, where are people doing things? Where are they having fun? Like yeah. not simply activism is very luxury. And, um, and yeah, so there's different versions of this too. So with the Harry Potter fan community, it involved the fact that I was so much an authentic Harry Potter fan. And that I was, I started to live and breathe in that community. So I think right. that part of it does require that that authentic, truly authentic relationship. And it's it, it's impossible to replicate that kind of thing because there's a grassroots uh, um, uh, pulling up your sleeves component to this. That out of those human relationships, you collaborate and and develop new projects based on the creativity of other people. Uh, it's an ensemble. Yeah, and you Please. can't come in. I mean, that's kind of the education part for you, right? It's like you needed to learn the books, you needed to learn the fan community. You can't come in as like a dilettante or an inner, you know, seem like someone from the outside that's trying to like, hey, I want to uh, instrumentalize all of you. Right. No, I think yeah. I mean, at first I was seen as that by, by by several people, and I think like, and and maybe that was true on some level, and I don't think it was on another one because I genuinely wanted. To, to make Harry Potter real for myself. It's almost a like kind of LARPing, but without wearing the costumes, uh, live action role playing where people dress up in, in wizard outfits. And that. I wasn't even wearing those, but I was still like living the part. I would imagine myself as Harry or, or Albus Dumbledore um, and, and in other works doing the same thing, part of the Rebel Alliance. Um, so yeah. there's that piece of it, of really allowing this to be theater and allowing this to be a kind of theater where it's not fake theater, it's good acting, it means you're, you are taking this very seriously. Um, and I think that's, that's a crucial piece of this. But I, I think also one of the beautiful things about creating a space that is the Harry Potter Alliance is that it allowed partners who were not Harry Potter fans, just normal nonprofits or activist groups to be able to plug in. So I think it'd be more practical for, for, um, for organizations and, and activists who are not living and breathing whatever the fandom piece is to right. connect with, with the influencers who are living and breathing it to give them that voice, uh, to give them something to say with their voice and that they want to, they want those things to be said. Yeah, I think we've we've talked about this uh, with a lot of folks that are pretty experienced, and I'm always surprised when they're like, oh, right, you know, it's like you're not going to that person or this group, like, asking them a favor or asking them to do something for you, you're giving them a gift, right? Like, hey, you already care about this. It, that's how it should, that's how you should feel about it, right? It's like, Absolutely. you care about this, I'm, we can support you. I can give you some information, I can connect you with this other group, 
and then you can actually achieve what you're hoping to achieve. I'm here to help, basically, right? Yeah. That should be the approach. Um, but let me go back to the education question, right? Because like, how do you, when when you have fans that maybe don't think of themselves as political or don't make that connection, you're making that connection. How do you do that? How do you make that? How do you do that education piece, both with the tools and the issue? Yeah. Uh, well, one advantage now in 2023 is that I think it's easier to find people who are interested and don't know what to do than it was yeah. in 2005. Um, True. We're in a much less politically apathetic moment, but it's still there's still plenty of apathy. It's just um, so yeah. How do you do that education? I think it's um, there's there's different tactics. So like let's say you you're at a fan conference and you apply to be a speaker at a panel at a fan conference and you get it. Um, and the, the panel discussion is around um, how you want to, like, how do we make the thing that we love real? So an example yeah, of a fan, yeah. fandom that's pretty active is Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, and that's an extraordinary theory. And that's not even Avatar, the uh, James Cameron piece, which is also a whole other discussion. But um, Avatar The Last Airbender, like, how do we uh, take what Aang did, uh, the hero of Avatar The Last Airbender, and put that into the world? Because we, we're having an ecological crisis. And you, you describe what happened in Avatar The Last Airbender in an emotional way. Um, and then you, you, you connect it to what is happening in our world on an ecological level and how are people being affected by it. How is that like what happened in Avatar The Last Airbender? And what can we do that is similar to Aang and his friends to take down the Fire Lord? Um, like, and, that's, and that would be the panel discussion. And then after the panel discussion, don't just go for the panel. You know, obviously, do all the normal organizing tactics of collecting emails and, um, and having conversations afterwards and attending the other panels and meeting those panelists and saying, I'm doing a thing. We're trying to make Avatar The Last Airbender, the, the messages of it, real and in the world. And on Twitter, message the creators of Avatar The Last Airbender. Let them know about this. Get a couple of media stories that are very small even. Those are important. I think also... It's good, and this is, this is one of the magical things about the Harry Potter lines, um, that I think often gets forgotten by me, actually. I came in, I came in with a wish to get these, these uh, fans, most of them young people, to become more activist, to become more uh, strategic, and thinking about social change from a structural standpoint, not thinking about community service. Um, but any time we mentioned literacy, People were getting more excited. So uh, I realized um, that we should be doing book drives, even though a book drive was something that uninspired me. So I just felt so uninspired by that compared to yeah. getting people to do advocacy against some big media company that's just trying to consolidate blah, 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 or, or structural. Yeah, there's no that. system change element. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's Band-Aid stuff. Yeah. Exactly. But the Band-Aid stuff uh, is what, provided not just candy, it also made me realize as an organizer and an activist that I was giving short shrift to the Band-Aid stuff. And mm -hmm. the Band-Aid stuff is the stuff of heart. It, it's also the, when we're doing advocacy, we don't know even in the, the, the unlikely event that we, we win. Mm -hmm. We don't even know normally what part we played. But when we're doing yeah. charitable work, we have a feeling of impact. We know no, no, nothing can take away that impact. And why right. I think that's so crucial is that helps us as activists keep the oxygen that we're remembering we're, we're in this for goodness. We're not just in this to stick it to the man. Yes, you want to do that, absolutely. But you merge those two things together, you start to have a more wholesome picture. Um, but uh -huh. you also still have the bad, the badass picture. And I think that's really important too because it also, it allows people who are uncomfortable with the activist aesthetic, but who want to do good and believe in the values of activism to enter and then to, to go up that ladder of engagement. And one of the things I admire so much with Fandom Forward now, which is you know, which is now the name of the Harry Potter lines, um, is, is how they've taken um, young people's passion for literacy, the sort of Band-Aid solution, and then tied it to advocacy for, for, uh, for, for public libraries uh, in partnership with the American Library Association. And there's, there's always a way to get those, those charitable pieces to become stronger. But I think when we're dealing with people who have never experienced those activist muscles, but they want to do good in the world, they want to fight bad, I think starting them on those, those, like those band-aid solutions mm -hmm. is actually a really great way to teach them how to do the whole thing. 
together. That's really great. I mean, I I will admit that I'm very dismiss. I have been very dismissive of that kind of thing, you know. Um, although also understanding at the same time that uh, you need to build people's confidence as they're starting, it, even if they're experienced. Like if you get a new group going, the first thing you do has to be successful, and it can be very small, but just so there's some momentum, right? And um, and I mean, it connects back to the education, right? It's like, hey, we can do this and we can win. That's part of the education. And by taking out, by making it something that's purely uh, charitable or, or um, like you're entirely in control of, right? Like the mayor's not gonna stop you from donating the books, right? <laughs> so exactly. um, so exactly. yeah, you. We, we had a we had like a former Republican that was like was like yeah oh gosh he was put on the news because he was well, this is a long story but they were he was part of a group that was reward, rewarding us with something and he didn't realize he was a prominent former Republican senator I can't even remember his name right now and he was asked what what he liked about the group about us and he didn't like anything about us but he said like he goes, well, I like that they encourage reading and it was really interesting now we have this weird like I yeah. Don't I don't want to be pushing like this sort of like um, milk toast bipartisanship. Everyone should get along, but I do think there is something really disarming, where it becomes really hard for people to dismiss you if they like an aspect of you. We had yes. we had young people that were against marriage equality that were part of the group early on. We didn't kick them out. We said you just can't advocate against marriage equality. You can do any of our other programming. They wanted to do the, the literacy pieces. I'm willing to bet that a lot of them ended up becoming. Um, a activists for marriage equality um, over time. And I think yeah. it also gets into another piece, which is thinking about, it's something that we as activists don't do a lot of, is reflecting about how our personalities are a little more excited by the combat pieces and other <laughs> other people are not as excited. So yeah. what I, what, there are people that don't want the battle. They don't get off on it, but they yeah. want to do good. And I think we get them by giving an opportunity to do something wholesome but then also help them say all the things that you love are getting ruined by this company. And you can do something about it too, simply by continuing to join. It's that ladder of engagement. And I think that holistic sense, you know, one of the most, talking about MRC, one of the strongest MRCs we've ever seen in the history of this country, the US, is uh, the civil rights movement, of course. And mm -hmm. like, what was the underlying community in the myth ritual community? It was the Black Baptist Church. And the Black Baptist Church doesn't recruit based on activism. It recruits based on giving people existential cosmic grounding. And they right. also do things that are charitable. And from that community, when it is ready to stand for systemic change, it can because it has a multitude of personalities. So I think it's a real weakness we have as activists is we only think about how do we get more people to have our combative personalities instead of how can we learn from people who have less combative personalities and how do we genuinely bring them in, have genuine uh, relationships with them. Yeah, I, I think for me, it takes a different form. It's like um, a mix. Like, I, I don't like battling. I like winning. <laughs> and the feeling of like, hey, we did it. And, and that's what some of that charitable stuff does. Is, but it takes out all the risk, right, of like failure because you can do it. But the other thing uh, that I really like is like sort of the clever problem solving stuff. Of I mean, it's the creativity, right, of like, People think we've tried all these things, it doesn't work. Yeah. But you got to teach people, like, they don't know that feeling, right? Like, uh, it takes time to accumulate the wins and realize that every once in a while it can be done and the confidence. Um, I was going to ask about you, early on, you said, you know, coming in as uh, someone working for the Harry Potter Alliance, especially at that point, it was um, you worried about being taken seriously. And, you know, I, I have that too sometimes, like I'll come in with a project idea that I know if either they're going to love it or they're going to be like, you're insane, you know. Um, and so uh, some of that is like self-consciousness and some of it is legitimate. It's always a mix. But um, how, how do you, how did you manage that? What would you, and what would you say to people who are sort of dismissive of fan culture and, and fan activism? I, I developed a very uh, silly theorem that I, that I find a lot of pleasure in uh, called the three, the three P's. The three P's to success and achieving any purpose are patience, persistence, and pizzazz. And most of us have a lot of two of those things. Most of us do not have all three of those things. For me, I normally have a lot of persistence. 
had a lot of pizzazz. Uh-huh. Don't have a lot of patience. I, 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 <laughs> and so, so it's, it's like when you look at like Hillary Clinton, she has a lot of patience, a lot of persistence, and almost zero pizzazz, at least in public. You look at Donald Trump, he's all persistence and, and pizzazz with, with like the patience of a flea. Like there's no patience at all. So yeah. there's, these are things, I mean, he's a different you know, person, but like, I, so I think that patience, persistence, and pizzazz is essential to, to our success. And really nurturing, if you're someone who lacks patience, how do you build that patience? Um, as far as, I mean, other activists have really been skeptical of, of the work that I've done. Um, and sure. then over time, it's been so strange to have some of the people talk about me as though I'm some kind of genius. When, when you know, just a couple of years before, they thought I was not worth talking to and, um, and nothing changed except mm-hmm. their perception. Which, which shows that you know, over time, this is part of social change. If, if your fellow activists don't enjoy something, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just might mean that you might be a little early and that's awesome, that's disruptive. Um, I, I, there's one example, uh, when I was organizing around the Hunger Games um, and uh, I was meeting with union organizers and the union I was working with were really into this campaign we, uh, that I was leading around um, the Three Finger Salute from the Hunger Games as a connective tissue to protest um, economic inequality. Um, and um, so we were working with, with uh, I think it might have been Fight for 15, I can't remember now. And one of the, the union organizers were very enthused, but there were a couple that weren't uh, for different reasons. And one of them actually started crying, which I thought was, it really, it really made me feel humbled because she felt that this was such a, a cheap way to, to exploit the, the people that are suffering and being exploited so much. Um, mm-hmm. And I felt a little taken aback because I didn't know how to treat this person's tears because I, I wanted to respect um, the sorrow of where she was coming from while still advocating for the efficacy. Um, and at the same time, wonder, am I doing what she was afraid of? Like, am I doing uh, uh, this, this, is like exploiting workers thing that she's that she's saying. I would never want or to even that. sort of minimizing or not honoring, yeah, what the, the reality that's, is. That's exactly yeah. right, minimizing it. Like, and and I am sure that we can that argument could go on for ten thousand years and we can never figure out who who's right and who's not. But then I had the experience of actually being with the workers and just how excited they were to use the three fingers so that how excited they were to see themselves as part of a bigger story that everyone's paying attention to. How excited they were to say like that their kids are into the Hunger Games and this will make their kids proud of them. To see yeah. them as people who are part of District 13 fighting um, the, the Capitol in Pan Am, fighting President Snow. This gives the, the, the rhetoric and the language for their kids. And the irony to me of this was this person who was crying, truly coming from an amazing place and a place that I hope to come from as much as I possibly can. Um, but also, I think was wrong, and I think dangerously so, because mm. there is a kind of fetishization that mm. we have of humans. Oh, we don't want to minimize, but you're minimizing the fact that these are human beings who love fantasy because they're human beings. They love popular culture because they're people. Not all people love popular culture. Not all people love fantasy. But when you have kids, generally, you're going to be into it, and generally, you like it just feels like there's a lack of um, of appreciation for the the fact that like life is full of humor and weirdness mm-hmm. and and mythology and like if you don't respect that you are minimizing something like you, you literally are minimizing the humanity uh, and the the, th- the the people that you're organizing which is how we have a lot of uh, workers uh, end up some workers going for the far right. They have a more compelling story sometimes and they respect the tools of storytelling more um, than, than, uh, than, than a lot of people on the left who, who, who don't, um, uh, a lot of us on the left are so concerned with minimizing that we end up minimizing people. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Yeah. I, to me, um, you know, is if you're coming, it's important to be coming from a very sincere place, you know, and that uh, if it's not sincere, you know, then, then you're in trouble, but um, to to there is something that activists do, which is to treat 
people like just a, another body that will make an, a number, yeah. right? Like, so we we have this many signatures, we have this many people, but who those people are and the, and the richness of their lives is not really included. And that's a way of minimizing them, you know, that, that I think is, uh, it doesn't give them the opportunity to, like, if you say, hey, we're going to do this with the hun Hunger Games and we're going to do this three finger salute, like you're giving some structure that then they can work within, right? Like if you, we keep going back to Star Wars or Harry Potter or whatever these things, like people understand, um, like I've seen, I think probably all the Star Wars movies, but there's definitely people that are probably in that union that have seen them and and know them better than I do. And they're able to build on that, right? Like uh, an example we used to use, which is now pretty old, is uh, Billionaires for Bush. And it was like uh, people that would dress up like billionaires and campaign for George Bush as billionaires, as like cartoon billionaires. Yeah, and once you, what's that? Cash, I was cash is king, I was a billionaire. Okay, yeah, <laughs> nice, nice, cash is king. Yeah, so once you understand the premise, like anyone can step into it and play the game, right? And and what um, what a fandom does is like help define the field, right? Of like this is the this is the field we're playing on. You know some of the rules because you know the story, but on the field you can do all, you get to come up with your own name, you get to come up with your own moves, you know, like and it gives them agency that they don't have as you know one of 600 that marched on this on city hall right exactly yeah yeah exactly yeah and i think that's just it's just such a i need to dwell on this just for a second i just it's the irony of not wanting to minimize someone by not having them compared to a popular culture story minimizes them like there's a there's forgetting the fact that they actually care about those things and yet i think billionaires for bush is a, is a great example of something that allows you to have fun and enjoy, and yeah, that's that's a great example as well. But I do think I do think that when we think about organizing workers, just remembering that many workers have children uh, or grandchildren, and how do we get their children and grandchildren to be proud of the work and to be thinking like they want to go to the they want to go to the public events as well, um, mm -hmm. in a way that that like they can see their dad or their mom not as this. Um, this victim, but as this hero who's, who's who's owning their power and fighting the bad guys, which is what these stories are almost always about. So, yeah. like, that, like the idea of see, my dad is in the Rebel Alliance, that gives the, the person, the worker, a feeling of empowerment that's going to make them want to keep coming back anyway yes. to win the fight, get others converted. Um, to get to where my brain has been lately, has been thinking a lot about the core of these stories. And if, we can, if I can understand the core of them, I can, I don't think, right, one of the problems that we're in right now is I think we've lost the thread on what the story even is. Um, and part of the problem mm -hmm. is that so much is happening so fast and has been happening for a while so fast. And I don't really think we know how to link issues of corporate accountability, reforming corporations, all of the economic pieces along with the fact that like silicon valley is, is completely nuts with the fact that we've got a sixth mass extinction that is as that is worse than the extinction that, that killed the dinosaurs coupled with a climate crisis that and, and those are two different things that are, that are mm. overlapped we have a democracy crisis we have an opiate crisis we have an ongoing never-ending structural racism crisis it, it's hard to know um what we're doing and why and one of the pieces that I think when I was doing the, the core stuff with the Harry Potter lines, giving people a connection to Harry Potter or Star Wars helps create some order to, to the narrative uh, for people. What I've been thinking about lately is what if all of these stories have some common threads that can help us understand the big, the big story? And the common thread I keep coming back to is they're almost always about orphans and empires trying to kill them. And it yeah. is uncanny uh, when we have Dar Darcy is an orphan up against the Witch of the West. Luke Skywalker is an orphan up against the Empire. And that's not to mention, have you seen Andor yet? No, it's on my list. And, and of everything that any activist should see is Andor. Cassie yeah, and Andor is an I've orphan heard. up against the Empire. There's like, there's about two dozen, three dozen orphans from Star Wars. There's orphans. I mean, Santa Claus is technically an orphan in the uh, the the, uh, the L. Frank Baum story. It goes on and on and on. Um, how many orphans there are? Harry Potter, 
almost every single hero in Avengers game, in, in Endgame, Avengers is an orphan. Um, Lord of the Rings. Superman, started, Batman, right? Superman, like... yeah, Batman. It, and then you have, well, well, Superman was developed by these Jewish immigrants. Uh, Jew, yeah, uh, the children of Jewish immigrants who made a story to be modeled after an immigrant experience. Um, and immigration is, is being orphaned from your fatherland or motherland. Um, uh. And orphanhood starts to become a metaphor for any experience of loss and aloneness that you experience individually or collectively. And so that right. journey of the hero is a journey of going from orphanhood and separateness to fullness. And what is crazy is that the empire is normally, in all these stories, normally run by an orphan as well, who is sort of the dark side of the hero. And, and they're trying to solve for their feeling of separation and aloneness, but they lose in the stories because the orphan hero finds something bigger than the empire they're fighting. Um, something that is connected, like, like the, the Gaia energy, the, the, the force, uh, yeah. Phoenix song and Harry Potter, dust in, um, in uh, his dark material. It goes on and on and on. And there is a, there is a cohesive narrative in this pattern that I'm, that I'm seeing, mm. I've been writing about. Uh-huh. I'm calling it the orphan and the empire because I think it's going to be crucial for us to really get a hold of the bigger story we're all in and seeing how the story is, is, is connected and how it, when it comes to a fight of orphans, up against empire trying to depend on the orphans but in order for us to do that we need to understand the story that we are in as we are fighting these big empires of uh of corporations or silicon valley or uh or illiberal uh, forces all over the world or um etc 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 okay i hope uh you like that one we got to talk about what it means to honor people's whole humanity and I love how Andrew said people who care about issues also have, you know, like things that they enjoy and, and their fans. Right. And how do you bring that out into everything you do? There's so much creativity there. There's so much passion that can be tapped into. Um, I thought what he had to say about that was really smart. And he changed my mind about those kind of Band-Aid solutions, right, or easy wins that uh, can help people build people's confidence. and um, and it's so important for maybe people that are coming new to uh, to activism to let them do these sort of good work, you know, canned food drives and things like that, that just build skills and camaraderie that's so important. And, I, you know, I'll, I'll admit, I, I didn't think about that. And I kind of forgot about the the how how those kinds of campaigns could do that work. I I would talk about that value of that but not think of it in those terms and so you know there's there's things i learn in every one of these conversations and i hope you are too um at the center we try to share this stuff so as many people can benefit from it it as possible a lot of these kinds of conversations i i've been able to have um traveling to do workshops um and they might happen in a restaurant or the back of a bar or in a long car trip um, but rarely in front of other people or recorded, right? So that's what we're trying to do here and share some of that with you. On our website at c4a.org, we're sharing all kinds of resources, printouts, lessons. Uh, we have an iEffect app that helps you plan an action, all kinds of things that we give away for free. The only thing that we ask is that if you enjoy stuff like this, if it's of value to you, to um, make a donation. And you can do that at the Center for Artistic Activism site, like I said, c4aa.org, and there's a little donate button there. It's tax deductible in the United States. Um, and that helps us to maintain the organization, to be able to give things away like this, and to uh, experiment too. Um, so please consider it. And you know, if you thought this was great and you saw me in a bar and you'd wanna buy me a drink or a coffee, just give it to the organization. Um, so thanks so much. And you can check out other conversations like this in our Rev- Revolutionizing Activism series. And uh, there are, I think, a dozen now. Uh, there's a bunch. And uh, if you like this one, I'm sure you'll like the others. So thanks a lot. And I'll see you next time.